Welcome to In Their 20s, a podcast with the best advice. My name is Landon Campbell, and I'm your host. And today we had a special guest on the show, someone who we've been trying to connect with since creating our podcast. We spoke with Dr. Meg J, the author of The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter, and How to Make the Most of Them Now. Dr. Meg Jay is a clinical psychologist and associate professor of human development at the University of Virginia. Her books have been translated into more than a dozen languages, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, and on NPR. Dr. Jay's TED Talk, Why 30 is Not the New 20, is among the most watched of all time. I really enjoyed our interview today, and I'm confident that you will too. So let's jump in with Dr. Meg Jay to hear about her best advice for 20-somethings and what she was doing in her 20s. Dr. Jay, how you doing? How are you? I'm just super um, lucky, fortunate, appreciative to have you on the show today. Thanks. Glad to do it. Fire away when you're ready. Uh, well, Meg, yeah, I'd love to begin at the beginning. Um, if you could just tell our audience um, a little bit more about yourself, you know, who are you? What are you passionate about? Um, and, you know, in a broad view, what were you doing in your 20s? Yeah, so who am I? I'm a clinical psychologist and I specialize in 20 somethings of all things because honestly, I'm passionate about helping 20 somethings, working with 20 somethings. It's the best age group in the world to work with, which we can talk about more later if you want. But um, I'm very lucky to be working in an area that's really rewarding, really meaningful, really fun, um, always interesting, um, and always intersecting with what's happening in the world. So it's it's a great life. It's a great job. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have work that feels so meaningful. Of course. No, I love that. Um, Impact-driven work is always super important. So we're going to be covering a lot of amazing topics today. Um, your book, The Defining Decade. Before we jump into the book, though, you know, I understand, and I've watched it probably four times now. A few years ago, you gave this legendary TED Talk. Um, it's actually one of TED's most uh, streamed um, speeches and uh, discussions, and it's titled, and I know a lot of listeners might be familiar with it, Why 30 is Not the New 20. And in that, you mentioned that 80% of life's most defining moments take place before 35. Just can you break down a little bit more about that statement and what that means in your view? Yeah, yeah. So that the data actually came from a cool study where they looked at the lives of, you know, successful people, like you were saying, later on, and they looked back and what they found was that about 80% of their most defining choices, moves, jobs, relationships, um, circumstances had happened by around the age 35. And um, what I really think is cool about the study is that they said that at the time they didn't realize how defining or how pivotal or how consequential those jobs and moves and relationships and choices were. But then when you look at a life, you know, span, you realize that what happens in the first 10 to 15 years of adulthood ends up being, of course, quite consequential, quite pivotal. And so it's really about that, that for most of us, kind of the big decisions, big choices of getting started in a career, finding a partner, figuring out what that's going to look like for us, maybe starting having families, picking a city, picking a state, picking a life, much of that work is going to happen by around the age of 35. And, you know, over the last few decades, it's crept closer to 30 than 50 years ago. It was all closer to 20, mm -hmm. but it's still happening, you know, before around the age 35. And so my work is really about, okay, if all this is happening a bit later than it did, but still, you know, kind of by the end of early adulthood, what do we do with those years before? Like, how do we get in front of life's biggest choices, life's biggest moves, life's biggest, you know, starter jobs. Um, so that's really what my work is about, is making good use of that time. And that time, of course, being the 20s, that defining decade, um, yeah. which is all yep. based off of the book that you created. Um, yeah. Talk to us about how you developed that book, um, you know, through speaking with so many clients, you know, what led to the creation of the defining decade and just the entire journey of creating this book and seeing its impact. Uh, what always puts a smile on your face? Uh, what definitely puts a smile on my face, and I'm so fortunate to say it still happens every day. I get an email every single day from a reader out there who I've oh. never met, never will met, who said, I read your book. It really made a difference for me. And so if you're an author, there's nothing better than that, that you just put this work out there. You have no idea you know, who's going to find it or who it will find. And just to hear that people are feeling helped 
um, and impacted by the work. I mean, that's what puts a smile on my face. That's how I open up the laptop every day and, you know, keep writing. So, um, so yeah, that's what puts a smile on my face. The reason I wrote it is because I've spent my whole adult life in college towns and training to be a psychologist in grad school and then having my own private practice teaching at Berkeley to start I had you know a full private practice tons of classes and they were all filled with 20 somethings who were struggling who were looking for help who were looking for guidance Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember at one point thinking you know I need to find a book that I can recommend that they could go read and kind of get what they're looking for. So I went to Barnes and Noble and back when people used to do that and looked at the shelves and there was just nothing there. You know, there was the girlfriend's guide to this or the three steps to that. But I wanted 20 some things to have better information than that. And, you know, having, got, having gotten my training in adult development, I felt like, and having listened to at that point hundreds, but by this point, thousands of 20 some things, I felt like I had real information that I wanted everybody to have not just people with therapists not just people who were in college or in graduate school but i wanted everybody to have it so that's why i wrote the book of course you, know, you had so much experience prior to publishing the book you know speaking with 20 somethings working with 20 somethings you had so much data to back that up but from the point of when you said i'm writing this book to when it was finally published you know how many 20 somethings if you were to um you know share did you speak with and then if you were i don't want to say group all the people that you spoke with together, but, um, you know, what are some common misconceptions about 20 somethings or just things that you learned uh, more about us while writing the book? Um, the common misconception that was driving, you know, sort of, I think I said in there in the acknowledgement, somebody gave me some good advice once, which is don't write a book unless you can't not write it because it's a huge project and it, <laughs> it'll rake you over the coals in many ways. And so um, the reason I could not not write the book is that I felt like culturally all the messages about 20 somethings were quite off, you know, mm-hmm. that there was that they don't have any problems or they don't want help with their problems. And my experience was, was that a lot of 20 somethings were struggling. We know these are the most uncertain years of adulthood. They're actually the years typically when mental health is at its lowest, uh, happiness is at its lowest, life is just getting started. So it's a tough time, even though culturally we paint it as, you know, quote, the best years of our lives. It's empirically, nothing could really be further from the truth. So I wanted to correct that. There was also at the time, this kind of prevailing sense of, you know, 30s, the new 20, if all these adult milestones are happening later than they used to, then you can just start everything at 30 and get everything you want. But what I was experiencing was that that didn't actually feel so great to 20 somethings to be sort of patted on the head and people to say, oh, whatever, you're young, you know, don't worry about this for years now. And I was also seeing a lot of 30 somethings that were feeling, you know, quite jammed trying to get everything in. So I really wanted people to see that, um, you know, it's a real developmental sweet spot in your 20s. It's a very unique time when, um, you know, you can get in front of what really matters. Of course. Yeah. A lot of people and, you know, friends, I have peers, I always hear, you know, I'll get things started when I'm 30. Um, right. But I agree. You got to get it started in your twenties. And within that, um, you know, through your work, you speak a lot about identity capital, uh, mm-hmm. building something in your twenties. And of course, you know, since this is your idea, I'd love for you to speak on it, but um, kind of just break down what is identity capital and how can 20 somethings um, find something that they're passionate about and just turn, uh, turn that into greater work. Yeah, so the concept of identity capital is one I wanted uh, 20 somethings to understand because what I would hear a lot about, oh, I hear these are my years of identity crisis, which sort of implies like angst and confusion and lostness. And that's not really that productive. Um, that actually the way 20 somethings sort of get a foothold in life is just by not n- knowing forever who they're going to be always and, you know, having an epiphany about that at 25, but just going out there and learning some things, getting some skills, getting some experience. So getting what's called identity capital, you know, go out there and get a job that adds value to who you are. And then you'll learn from that and move on to your next piece of identity capital that may be in the same line as what you did before, but maybe it's different because what you learned is that, you know, you were sort of headed in the wrong direction for you. So, you know, a lot of my clients or students feel stressed. You were talking about recently graduating from college and feeling like they need to know what they want to do forever. I say, forget about that. I mean, if you know, great, but many people don't. So just go get a job with some identity capital, 
see what that teaches you, see what you get from that, and then move on to the next thing with identity capital. And that's what modern careers look like, that the average 20 something has about five jobs before the age of 30. And so if wow. during that time, you're just chunking together various pieces of identity capital, something's gonna build from that. If instead of having those five jobs, you're sort of sitting there waiting to figure it out in your head before you do anything, people don't really figure life out that way. You kind of have to go out there and live it. Of course. Um, in your 20s, you have to be a sponge. Um, you know, I had very fortunate enough to have learned that early uh, in my career. Nice. You know, it's okay to just pick up different skills, try something new. Um, hell, you know, even create a podcast. <laughs> I mean, just yeah, uh, on the yeah. side, you never know what it can turn into. You never uh, know. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really powerful. Um, so before we pivot and discuss your 20s, um, you know, the journey to, um, you know, becoming a doctor, of course, and, you know, the work that you're doing today, um, I, I want to just talk a little more about uncertainty. Um, yeah. There's the big thing that we've all had to deal with, not just 20-somethings, all of us, but the pandemic. Um, yeah. There's a lot of stress as into, you know, what it's going to look like in the next few weeks and months because new things are arising. And it's a scary time, again, not just for 20-somethings, for everything, uh, for everybody. Right. But when it comes to overcoming uncertainty, because I believe you have a, another book as well that really um, talks about this, um, what advice do you have for us there? Um, you know, the, just, just troubling times. Um, how can we yeah. push forward and look to a better future? Well, I mean, I think something that people don't really understand about their 20s, or I'm trying to make people understand more, is that they're really the most uncertain years of your life that probably your 20s are going to be the only time of life where you wake up in the morning and in five years you don't know where you'll live you don't know what you'll do for a living you don't know where you'll work you don't know if you'll be happy or be able to pay your bills or if anybody's going to love you like most of the time in 30s and beyond you wake up with at least some of those things settled you know at least for now so i think people um underestimate the you know extent to which you know that's difficult to wake up that way every day in fact our brains hate uncertainty and interpret uncertainty as danger which is where a lot of the 20 something anxiety comes from is that you're living in kind of a constant state of danger of i don't know what's coming i don't know what's going to happen i don't know if my life's going to work out that makes people very stressed and anxious and what's been interesting for me to watch with the pandemic is um how much adults of all ages have struggled with that, rightly so, because like I said, our brains don't like it, it's not pleasant. But I think um, maybe many people don't realize that 20 somethings live that way all the time, you know, pandemic or no pandemic. It's, it's unusual for someone my age to sort of not know what life's gonna be like in three months or six months. It's been a while since I felt that way, but of course, with the pandemic, everybody's been feeling that way of, I don't know if I'll have my job in a year. I don't know what my life is going to look like in a year. And um, that's really the way it feels to be a 20 something, I think, uh, for many people all the time. Of course. No, really reassuring to hear that because uh, uncertainty is a scary thing. But, um, you know, I think it's appropriate to say we need to embrace it a little bit and understand that we're all in this together. Yeah, um, well, you know. Too. Yeah. So one of the, I think one thing you asked me was how to get through that. And mm -hmm. no one's going to like this answer <laughs> because what people would like is some form of certainty. But okay. honestly, I think the it quality for 2020 and beyond is being comfortable with uncertainty um, because it's not going to be, it's not going to go away overnight in your 20s that, you know, like I said, the defining choices kind of take shape by 35. I mean, it may be that long before you kind of wake up in the morning and you sort of know what your life is. And then of course the pandemic has added a whole other layer. So I think just getting more comfortable with uncertainty, not interpreting it as catastrophe, that it's really just uncertainty. Could work out well, could work out not well, could be something in between, could lead to something you didn't expect, like a podcast, like you said. Just being more comfortable with life being uncertain, um, I think is a quality that all adults really need right now, but especially 20-somethings, because it's not, life isn't going to be certain tomorrow. Totally agree. Um, and before we do pivot to your 20s, um, I just want to discuss getting comfortable with one more thing. And uh, that's something that a lot of 20-somethings are unable to uh, find comfort around, and that's failure slash rejection. Um, what advice do you have there? You know, it, it's okay to get rejected from said job or failure in your 20s. Just, I mean, I've really understood just how healthy 
failure is, but I'm yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm quoting someone, and I don't know who, but you know, the concept of fail early. I mean, if if mm -hmm. you're not failing at anything or struggling with anything, you're probably not getting out of your comfort zone. And so, I think, um, I mean, it's absolutely okay to fail, if that even is is the word. What I'm, I wish I could think of who I'm quoting now, but there's some quote. I think it's um. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute, but there's a quote that's um, like, I never fail. I just learn I love something them. like that. We'll and find um, it and link it to we'll the find it. Yes. <laughs> thank you. It might be Nelson Mandela. I could okay. be wrong, but that's my thinking that maybe that's it anyhow, but just to, you know, your twenties are when you should just be learning, 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 growing, growing, growing. Um, and so that means getting out there and doing new stuff that makes you feel anxious and stressed and sometimes doesn't go so well, mm -hmm. but in doing that, you're really learning. And, um, you know, I know you said, we're going to talk about my twenties in a minute, but I didn't do everything right in my twenties. But one thing I did, I think do well is in grad school, I really had this attitude of give me every kind of client, give me every kind of challenge while I have supervision, you know, while I'm not the last word on things. I just want to learn, 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 and really roll my sleeves up and, you know, take in all I can before it's just me, you know, in my thirties and beyond. And um, I think that really paid off. Of course. Another quote for you, uh, learn in your twenties, earn in your thirties. On the there you go. Exactly. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and it's clear that, you know, as you just said, in your twenties, uh, you were just very learn forward. I want to learn this. I want to experience this. So let's talk mm -hmm. about that. When did you yeah first um, realized you wanted to follow the path of a clinical psychologist. Um, what like went into that thought um, or that mindset? And then, you know, just your appreciation for education as well. You know, you went to grad school and then also um, mm -hmm. further school after that. Um, you know, what really did you love and appreciate about your time in college? Yeah. So, you know, college went from, I mean, I wouldn't say college was, you know, like all fun and games. I had my ups and downs like everyone else, but I think in, from a learning perspective, it sort of went the way they say it's supposed to. And that I, when I went into college, I really quote, had no idea what I wanted to do later. I think part of the reason for that is that like many young people, I hadn't really reflected a lot and hadn't really sort of done a gut check with myself of what I'd been good at so far. So I think if you'd really made me sit down and think about it, I probably would have guessed in the right direction. But I went into college feeling like I knew nothing, you know, and so I took, you know, the core curriculum and the breadth and, you know, tried this and that and whatever. And, you know, one day it dawned on me that, gosh, I love all my psychology classes. I can't wait to do the reading. It's so interesting. It comes easy to me because I love it. I'm doing well in it. Why don't I become a psychologist? And this was something that, you know, really came from just trying out a whole bunch of courses and then seeing what clicked for me. So I did major in psychology. The general plan was grad school, um, I think, but like many people, I, you know, that was a thought, not a certainty. Um, I was certain I was quite burned out after undergrad mm. and there was no way I was going to be able to go straight to grad school and clinical psych, which can be quite long, you know, five to seven years often. So I knew I needed to do something else. Somehow I had the sense to know I should do something with words I didn't know yet, identity capital, that I should do something that added value, that challenged me, and that people would later say, oh, that's cool, tell me about that, or wow, that's interesting, what did you learn? So I went, my first job out of college was uh, working as an outward bound instructor, which, you know, in some ways is not the most ambitious job one could have, however, experientially, it taught me a lot about leadership, about being self-motivated and organized and working with groups and special populations. So I learned so much, gained a lot of confidence in terms of, you know, hey, if I can do this, I can do anything, which is a, a useful, you know, feeling to have no matter how true or false it may be. Um, so that was a good um, first bit of identity capital for me. So your identity capital does not have to take place in an office building, doesn't have to involve a briefcase or a Zoom call. Um, for me, it didn't. Um, it just meant going out there, learning, challenging myself, growing, but also taking the break that I needed from academics um, because I, I was burned out after college like a lot of people. 
Of course. Yeah. It's another thing that you're just able to put energy towards and learn. Um, you know, I just really love this idea of identity capital and I know our listeners are really going to be super excited to learn about this. So thank you so much for breaking that down, Meg. Yeah. Um, you know, my final question for you uh, as we get closer to the end is, uh, you know, thinking about, um, you know, everything as a whole, um, everything that you shared, you know, from your twenties, developing this book, a place I always love to end our interviews is, you know, to focus on what's next. Um, so talk to us a little bit more about the work that you're currently doing. Um, and might we get a part two to the, the defining decade, especially <laughs> after the pandemic, it might be really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, people always ask, when's the 30 something and the 40 something and the 50 something book coming? If I were smart, I probably would have done that years ago, but I guess I'm not. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, when I wrote The Defining Decade, I think I thought, you know, okay, that's what I have to say about 20 somethings. I'm done with that. Mm -hmm. But it just led to more conversations like this, more emails from people who were felt so sort of impacted by the book. So after that, I wrote another book you referred to. It's called Supernormal. Mm -hmm. And it's about, actually, it's about adults, but who grew up with adversity. So, you know, alcoholism in the home or a mentally ill sibling or whatever. And then many of them are young adults trying to figure out how do I build a better life than the one I saw as a kid. So that's kind of a specific kind of 20 something that I for a time was seeing a lot in my office. I think now I'm more interested in uh, still focusing on 20 somethings because the defining decade just really kind of you know, created that for me even yes. more made me more interested, I guess, rather than less and um, I'm really more interested in focusing specifically on 20 uh, something mental health, mm. which would have been an obvious first book for me, but it, it um, and I actually did have a little bit about mental health in the defining decade originally and my editor said you know that's a whole other big topic like you'll write other books save that for another book so that mm -hmm. you don't try to do too much in one place which was excellent advice. Um, so I think I want to more explicitly focus on young adult mental health and uncertainty and anxiety. Um, and turns out, you know, there's probably ne never a better time to do that than right now. So. Oh, totally, totally agree. Um, that's something that we all need to improve on. Uh, just being able to check on ourselves. Um, you know, I think a lot of people always focus on physical health, but mental health also um, is very, very important. Um, could we get maybe a sneak peek of something to come or like, you know, just a way... <laughs> that we uh, some things can have a checks and balances as in to like be able to stay in tune with our mental health. What, what would you advise there? Yeah, I think my general, I don't, you know, can't give it all away right now, <laughs> but um, I think my, my, maybe not surprisingly, my general approach to young adult mental health is really sort of a, a growth mindset approach is that mm -hmm. I don't like for people to get too hung up too early on diagnoses or identities, you know, mm. I'm an anxious person, I'm a depressed person, I'm a, you know, whatever person, um, because the 20 something brain is changing a lot, life is changing a lot, mental mm -hmm. health tends to improve after your 20s. So I don't like for young people to get too hung up on <laughs> finding labels and categories and deciding this is the end state of their mental health when actually these, this may be the low point, I'm sorry to say, but the good news on that is life tends to get better, mental health tends to improve, you know, as life improves. And so I really have a um, kind of a developmental growth mindset approach to mental health that, you know, it gets better. And some of my work is around, you know, how. Love that. Well, can't wait to see what's to come. Dr. J, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I love, love hosting these um, interviews just because I learned so much. Um, and I know our listeners have so much to take away from this interview, but really, I mean, you just shared so much that's really going to help me <laughs> figure out my life a little better too as well. Well, so I much. appreciate that. Thank you so much. And hey, good luck with it. I, thank I, you. you know, I'm glad you, glad you started it. Can't wait to see where it goes. Well, thank you so much for streaming our interview with Dr. Meg J the author of The Defining Decade. If you enjoyed this interview and want more content like this, make sure to subscribe to In Their 20s wherever you enjoy your podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. We're also on socials, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Wherever you're at, we're there. See you next week.